It's unparalleled in its success on the internets. It is the fifth mascot. Not one, not three, but five. Count them. Along with the man that runs WCPO.com and, frankly, had, an, had a hand in inventing the internet, Mike Cannon. <laughs> I'm Ken Brew. Joined again today by the moral and social conscience of Cincinnati sports journalism, John O'Rourke. John, welcome. Glad to be here, Ken. All right. <clears throat> Let's talk about the dearly departed. Now, I'm not talking about my Aunt Grace, who left this earth at the age of 97 five days ago. I'm talking about Johnny Cueto. Johnny Cueto departed here on Sunday. He will make his first start, we think, tonight for the, his new team, the Kansas City Royals, in Toronto. These numbers are just off the charts terrific. But, John, there was no way in hell that they could afford Johnny Cueto past this year. I'm sorry to see him go. I'm happy to see what he did in his time here. And I think that should be the prevailing attitude with Johnny Cueto, should it not? Yeah, I, th I think it is. I, I've been here covering the Reds for 30 years, and I would think that he's, years. he's either in the top one or two of Red starters that I've seen since Tom Seaver. Probably Riho was a little bit better. Obviously, he has a higher profile with the uh, mm -hmm. World Championship ring, but uh, Cueto's right there with Rio. Basically, he's our Pedro Martinez. I would, yeah, and I would probably throw... Although I would, after those two, I would put Mario Soto. Mario Soto, right. But, but if He's Mario right Soto was pitching today, they couldn't afford to keep him either. So it's no. just it's the economics of the game, right? Yeah, and, and, and even if they literally had the money to pay Cueto, I don't think it would be a good investment. No. I mean, you would, you would end up in three or four years regretting that deal. Yeah, and you're, 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 you're basically, when you make a deal like that, you have to say, what is the back end of this deal going to do to me? Mm -hmm. They obviously didn't think about that with Joey Votto. They have to since then do that. But yet they, they jump right in that water with, with Homer Bailey. And again, this isn't so much Joey Votto, I think, as the residual effects of backing Bailey a couple of years ago. You know, there's no doubt about that. I think at the time before the injuries, Bailey was probably a kind of guy you'd be more inclined to give a long-term deal to with the, with the two no-hitters. But now because of the injuries, it doesn't look like a great deal. But I still think there's a way out of this. I think the problem they've got right now is can they unload Mike Leak before the uh, trade deadline on Friday? Yeah, I think that's the problem. It, you know, if they can unload Leak and get back a couple of, couple more prospects and just keep loading up and then do something in the offseason, because right now it seems like, and we'll get into who they got for Cueto in a second, I'm sure, but it seems like they have loaded up on good young pitching, which is a great problem to have, right. mm -hmm. but it might not be a good solution for a short-term, let's try to win next year or in 2017. When you guys, but don't you think, the phrase you guys are using, which I think is appropriate, is, is unload. And I think that's the market that they're in now is people are treating yeah. them like they, we have to unload them. That's what we were talking about when, you know, some of us didn't want to have the trade before the All-Star game just to have the, you know, the kumbaya feeling that we maybe still had a team in the race. But now it seems like maybe you've waited too long because I think everybody's going to hold back on what they're going to give us. Yeah. You know, because they know that we, we only got a few days. But, it, but that's what's being tweeted out there is the Reds are in a, in a, in an, a dump salary mode, an unload mm -hmm. salary mode, and they said anything to get cheaper. But honestly, if you step back from it and you accept what Mike said, which is they're not going to be good for the next couple of years. I mean, you got to accept that. Who they got, I thought, was pretty damn good work by Jockety. Brandon yeah. Finnegan. Uh, by all accounts, can be a uh, optimum middle of the ro rotation guy. At worst, he's going to be a setup guy. He might close for you, but he's certainly great value coming back at a less expensive cost. And he's also got major league experience. And oftentimes, when you trade for somebody at this time of the year, you're not getting players that have major league experience. He does, John. He, he does, and he's got um, three pitches. He can obviously close. He's got that kind of arm, but. The Reds envisioned him as a starter, as did the Royals when they drafted him. He pitched in the College World Series the same yeah. year they pitched in the uh, Major League yeah. World Series. So I think he was a great addition and obviously was the key to that deal. Yeah, and, and, and Mike, this is a guy right here, well, okay, in, in three years when they are good, thinking ahead, your ace is hopefully going <laughs> to be... We like that. What's that? We like that. We, we, in three years when they are good. Yeah, I think <laughs> okay. they will be. I mean, I'm with I, you. I, no, I, think, just, I, think, I like it. I think... Your ace is going to be Robert Stevenson. Your, your number two guy, if he's healthy, is probably going to be Homer Bailey. And then if this guy's rolling in here as your third starter, and then you have a combination of Di Sclafani or Moscot or Iglesias or any of these other guys that are, that are up here now, 
that's not a bad rotation. It really is. I think they're really setting themselves up to have a really strong, good young pitching staff. Sort of like if you look at who, what the Cardinals have. Mm -hmm. You know, they've got Martinez and they've got Waka and they got all. They had all those guys in the in the pen, and then they're starting to deal off some of those guys. Like they just traded Kaminsky for Brandon Moss and stuff like that. You load up, and I think Jockey has been smart to take the approach of let's get the best available talent I can get for these guys, and let's not say, well, you know, it'd be great. We got a lot of good young pitchers. Let's go out and let's get someone who can play the outfield and is closer than Winker or Philip Irvin, and uh, let's go out and just get the best guys that, that okay, Royals want a deal. They want Cueto. Let's take the best three guys they'll give us for Cueto, and I think that's been smart, and Finnegan is great, and he probably is the centerpiece of the deal, but the other two guys they got, Yep. are no slouches either. I mean, right. Lamb at one point in time was the number 18 prospect in all of baseball before he had Tommy John surgery, and it just took took him a few years to come right. back. And he's 91 right now. Yeah. With the, with the he was not or was 91 with the Triple A team at Omaha. It's yeah. true. A, a lot of scouts talk about guys having a nice loose arm. When I saw Lamb on the highlight reel, he has a very loose arm, which is a great compliment to a future major league pitcher. He wings it up there, and he just can sling it, and it comes in. Really hard. So I, I agree with Mike. I think they were great additions they got for Cueto. Yeah. I yeah mean, loose arm is a happy arm. Loose yeah, arm. Like a groin. Arm. Loose groin is a happy arm. <laughs> I a think groin that's true. Arm. Loose arm is a happy arm. I mean, I, I think for, for two months of Cueto, you know, you look at what would they have gotten if they didn't deal Cueto. And the answer is they would have gotten a draft pick, a compensation draft pick at the end of the year. And I think, if you, so if you look that and stack that up against the three guys they got in this deal, I think you'd say you'd take just Finnegan over that compensation draft pick, let alone the other two guys they threw in. So. But they got to keep going. they yeah. got to keep going. And as we do this show, you're, we're coming on like 24 hours to go before the trade deadline. And you got Leak, and you got Chapman, and you got Bruce. Now, Leak's got to go somewhere. He's got to. You can't say, well, we'll just write it out with Mike Leak or try to make a, a non waiver deadline deal with the guy next month because you know there are going to be claims put on him. So it's like, and, and Price went today to the Toronto Blue Jays. John, they're running out of places for Mike Leak to go. Well, not really, because I said this yesterday, Ken, that the three teams that were in the market for Price, the two teams that didn't get Price, would be in the market for Mike Leak. And they, frankly, is yeah. the Dodgers and the uh, New York Yankees. So I think you'll see Leak go to one of those two teams. I hope you're right. Really? You said that yesterday? Uh, yeah, said that, yeah, because look, <laughs> look at it this way. Leak is not a front of the rotation guy, obviously, like no. Price is. There's no way. But yeah. the teams that are going for it, especially with the way Leak's been pitching recently, can see him in, in a two-hole. And he might be better, almost better than anybody they've got. I mean, obviously, let's face it. I think the Yankees, they have this middling kind of rotation where you don't really have an ace. But I think Leak, the way he's pitching now, could slot in there pretty well. And they've actually got some uh, decent players to trade in New York. So don't be surprised if he's wearing a Yankee uniform tomorrow. Dodgers just mm -hmm. allegedly got, finally got, late, Latos. Yeah. yeah. So you'd have, you got That's Kershaw, Latos, Leak. I mean, obviously they're, you know, even though their pitching may be okay Granky. right now, it get real, Granky, it Don't can really. the guy who started the right, All-Star game. <laughs> it, can, it can really get, it can really get good and different in a hurry out there. Yeah. Yeah, I and mean, you he's, he's one of those guys, and he was he was his mentor. Uh, he's like a Bronson Aurora, Arroyo. He doesn't seem to throw in a manner that's going to hurt his arm. Right. He can go out there all the time. If you get a guy who can pitch 200 innings or close to it, you know, for five years in a row, that's gold in the major leagues right now. I mean, oh, yeah, he's those, a it, smart people pitcher. don't last that long. Yeah, he's a smart pitcher. I think he, he, and when he gets, we've seen him before. When he gets on a run, right. he can be pretty dominant for a while. He gets that sinker going, and and he can he can really be a very effective starting pitcher. But sometimes every now and then he'll have a bumps and bruises. He had like three or four starts in a row that were just mediocre. Uh, I think he's got value. It's just a question of when did the Reds kind of finally get around to making that deal? And maybe maybe you're right, John. Maybe they were sort of maybe the market was sort of mm -hmm. waiting to see what happened with Price. I mean, I, I think so. The interesting thing about we talked earlier about Jay Bruce. If they if they trade Jay Bruce, and I think it's a long shot now, but if they trade him, Ken's right. They're definitely giving up on the next two years because they don't have enough hitting as it is. They yeah. lose him. There's no way they get back that quality hit every return. They're probably going to get another pitcher back. So I think even though fans hate to hear it, you're probably talking about 2017, 2018 is the next time the Reds are good. Um, yeah. Chapman is drawing some interest from, uh, I think, a strange place, which is Arizona. Yeah. Uh, I mean, the Diamondbacks are, are not good, but they have a chance to get better, as all teams do, if they do the right thing. 
Chapman going to Arizona. Let's just think about this for a second. Every team, a team like Arizona can upgrade at any position, but why would you trade for a closer? Why would you trade for somebody that closes games on a team that right now, at least to me, still needs starting pitching? Why would they make that deal? That one's got me puzzled. Unless they were going to say, look, we'll trade for the dude, but we're going to make him a starting pitcher. I mean, they, they, they like the fact, I think, that he's got one more year under control. So I think they're looking at, well, everything that I've read is that they're looking at, or the speculation is that they're looking at, can he help us potentially get sneak into the wild card this year? And regardless, then we still have them for next year kind of thing. So, and, yeah. and the other big issue with Araldis is obviously we've seen it here. No matter what anybody says, there's no doubt in my mind, he does put people in the seats. And I think the issue with Arizona is they're looking for some glitz and glamour, and Araldis Chapman definitely provides that. So it's not a bad deal. He's not the only guy. Uh, I think the only, not the only team that's out there looking at him. Conceivably, the Astros would be in the market. And um, there was one other team I can't remember. But uh, the, the point is, is that... There's only a couple teams left that can use him for the rest of the season. The point, though, Mike and Ken, is that since he's under contract for next year, Reds don't have to trade him now. Yeah. They can trade him in the offseason. And, and that's the thing that's good for, for Chapman and Bruce is they can kind of see what, what the market is right now. They can wait. They can trade him in the offseason or they can hang on to him for one more year. Uh, I think unless they really put together and make some major changes for 2016, they'd be crazy to keep Chapman in, in the offseason. But if they feel like they can put some elements around the rest of that team and they can turn it into a winner in 2016, then, then maybe you hang on to that, them. That was one of those things I, I read it on the Internet. Uh, but, and it sounded like it was crazy. I mean, but then they said that Stewart uh, conceded. I mean, he admitted that that's it. He had made the inquiry and he was interested in, uh, you know, Putting putting something out there for Chapman and for the Diamondbacks. I don't know. Which I thought it was. I was like, is that this Dave Stewart that I'm thinking of? I didn't even know he was their general. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, here, here's the other guy that I think that the Reds have to really look at dealing is Marlon Byrd. Yeah. I mean, I think you know as teams start to look at bats, maybe some of those teams that are calling about Jay Bruce, you say, oh well, you know, if you won't take this package for for Jay Bruce. What if you take a little slightly lesser, give us a slightly lesser package yeah. and take Marlon Bird off our hands? I think he's gone, middle of next month. And I just, I just saw the other team besides Houston that might be interested in Chapman. And hold on to your seats because it's the Toronto Blue Jays who have already made all kinds of deals. Yeah. They could actually use a closer of Chapman's quality. So don't be shocked if he winds up in Toronto. Toronto still has prospects left. Hard to believe given all <laughs> that they've traded away for Tulowitzki and a big deal today for Price. But obviously... Uh, Toronto's got players. The interesting thing about Marlon Bird, he probably won't vest in that number of at bats he needs to uh, get that added incentive uh, that's in his contract. But you're right, fellas. That's the guy that's surprising me maybe the most that he hasn't been traded because he's still hitting well. And you got to think that there's some teams out there that need a left field bat. Oh yeah, and like, and he's. You have options. He's affordable for the rest of this year. Because you only have, he's not making a ridiculous amount of money. He only has a couple years left, and he's he can be either a rental player or if you want to pay him his thirteen million dollars next year, you can do that too. Mm -hmm. I, you think he'd be crazy to do that? But, He'll be thirty nine. But right. how much of this do you think is 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 the owner not willing to accept the fact that it's that with this core it's over, or with this group it's over? I said on the radio Monday that I think Bob Castellini took the first big step by trading Cueto, and that's admitting that it's not working here and that I've got to start thinking about the future. But I still think he's in love with these guys, and he really doesn't want to trade them. I think there's emotional ties. I think he's at a I, – I just sense it. I don't don't know it, but I sense it. How much – of but, but do you sense that, too, that there's still like, I just don't want to give up on this core group that I have, and that's why Chapman is still here, and that's why Bruce is still here? Well, I definitely feel that way about Chapman because – yeah. He's a guy that uh, Mr. Castellini obviously loves. Once I saw Cueto go, I realized that Bob is bought into the idea that this team's not going to be good again for a couple of years because you let an ace like Johnny go, you're conceding that uh, much as I love these guys, can't keep them. Now, the guy you got to mm -hmm. think about again is Jay Bruce because along with Chapman, he's a guy that Castellini really likes. Bruce does comport himself very well. Mm -hmm. He's a great... Um, Example, great role model for this franchise, and unfortunately, he's had some off years. But I still say to try to get back a return of hitting for him that's as good as his potential, it's not going to happen. Somebody's going to try to get him on the cheap with the idea that we can make him better, we can get him right, and yeah. you don't give up a lot when you do that. 
Well, and I mean, he's come around. Bruce has played pretty well over the last yeah, two he, months of the season, so I could see there being a potential market for him, but I, I agree. I mean, you, you, if you're trading Bruce now, unless you're getting back an amazing package of players, you're giving up on next year because I don't think they have enough offense, no. as is, let alone without Bruce. I know, you, I know you're a little more optimistic than I am. I think this team's cooked until 2018, and I think, I think they're loading up on this young pitching, and they, and they know that it's going to be a while before this young pitching is going to be major league, really good, contending young pitching. And uh, the question I go back to always with this is, and, and my year is 2018, who's going to be here in 2018 when this team is good well, again? Well, I think, I think if, if the Reds believed what you said, that they won't be good until 2018, then Frazier would be up, up for trade. Right. Bruce would be, because those guys, I mean, Frazier's contract, I think, ends after the 2017 season. So. Frazier is up after next year. I think he's got one more year. He's got. He's got. He I think he's got a, an option or something. I don't know. Do you know, John? No, I think. I think Ken's right. I think he does. I, you're both right. Actually, he has one more year, and I think he has an option on top of that. So. Yeah. P fact of the matter is, is, yes, he should be on the block. But I think it's it's interesting that he's not on the block. When everybody says he should, you know, they're not. When everybody says they should trade Bruce, they're not. I just sense that emotion is coming into business, or or, or they view this thing completely different than I do. But I don't sense that when they're good again, that Frazier is going to be uh, is going to be in his prime. I don't sense that we know Phillips isn't may not even be here. Uh, you've got to question your catcher being healthy enough to catch. I I think if I'm running that show, I'm, I'm 2018 and I'm selling the fans. Look, we're rebuilding. This is what we're targeting. But we think if we do the right thing, we could be there in a couple of years. I, I think. I don't, I don't think maybe emotion is as much of a factor as I think, number one, they want to keep people coming to the games. They mm -hmm. want to keep fans in the seats. And Chapman and Bruce are names that do that. And I and think Frazier. And Frazier, definitely Frazier, especially now after the home run derby. But I also think that, that the second part of what you said is, is more to the point, and that's that they view things differently than you do and that they think that they can be a contender in 2016. That may be diluting themselves a little bit. Um, I don't. I, I don't th know. I I think they're just they're not. I, I think they sort of know what Ken said or believe that it's 17 or 18 at least, but they're not ready to. Ju that if you go if you go far enough down that you're trading uh, Frazier right now, you've bought into that. You would have had Chapman gone. You would have had Cueto gone three weeks ago, and you would have. You know what I mean? At this point in time, I don't. I don't think they've bought into it. They sort of know that. I think next year they'll probably trade Frazier, if the, you know, because next year there probably will be they'll be you know toward the bottom right from the beginning, and they won't have any aspirations of being any good. But this is the beginning of I think uh, metamorphosis or something that they're gonna. It's gonna slowly sort of come upon them that you know yes we have to gut you know all of our major players or most of them to get this, the young talent that we need for two three years. You know that, that, that's a great point, Matt, because. What we've all been saying today is we don't know what's going to happen. And I think that comes from ownership and the GM not being willing to say what's going to happen. If you look, yeah. you look at Detroit, David Dombrowski, the GM, said, look, we're going to reboot this thing. Everybody knew. They were, and they, they wait, he waited a while to say that, but they knew at that, everybody knew at that point they're going to trade Price and they're probably going to unload Cespedes, their, their fine uh, power hitter. And here, you know, Wall always plays things close to the vest. No question, Mr. Kessling has been too involved with the management of this team. Most franchises don't get good until the owner steps back. The idea that you can rebuild and still be good while you're rebuilding, it's not going to happen. That's the Ken's point, and I think that's the mistake this franchise is making. One or the other, fellas, either you're in it to win it or you're rebuilding. You can't do both, and a doggone better be uh, rebuilding because if you look at Quato being gone, there went the ace, and those guys just don't come along. I think the only way you can do that is if you're like the Rays or some or the A's, and that you have such a good, strong yeah. pipeline of young players right. and they don't. that you can say, "All right, we'll deal this one one spot here because we know the guy that we have coming up can fill that spot for ten million dollars less and can do the mm -hmm. same thing." Sort of like when the Reds let Arroyo go because they had like Singrani and other young guys, and they're like, "You know what? We think we can right. plug someone in who can do just as good a job as Arroyo for ten million dollars less." But, but why but, they do that, Mike, <laughs> is is their guy down there, Friedman. Mm -hmm. He always trades a year before a guy's deal is up because right. he knows he can get increased value. Yeah. Right. And they refuse, yeah, you know, this is the year then you trade Chapman. This yeah. is the year you trade yeah. Frazier. This is the year you trade Bruce 
because you'll get more value. That's why the Rays may not always win it, yeah. but they're always in it because they have players that have proven track records and you know what you're getting as opposed to some guy that might be bouncing around single A that you're probably going to wind up with if you make a deal for leak at this point. Yeah. Hey, guys, don't you think, uh, you know, we're talking about rebuilding, don't you think a thorn in the side has been leadoff hitter, center fielder? I mean, <laughs> how long has that been going on? We had Stubbs, he didn't work out, couldn't lead off, couldn't play, you know. Well, he's a good center fielder. But, you know, then we got Hamilton, and he can't get on base. Nope. You know, good defensive players, but that's kind of been a problem. I, I, think, they're I, gonna, I think they're going to wait out Hamilton. No, oh, they have to. I don't know. They yeah. have a choice. Unless yeah. they, right. unless well, I, I, that's part of it. I, I just think he's the, the potential for me, when I go down to the games, which isn't a lot, but when I go down to the games and when you watch on TV, the potential for, for Hamilton is way, way high. If, if he could ever hit 250, 275, get on base, you know, over 300, then I think he's phenomenal. Boy. He just he gets around the bases like that. But and it's, yeah. it's kind of like a Chapman thing. When he gets on, there's a buzz. People are like, okay, watch, watch. It's going to be two or three pitches, and he's going to go. Mm -hmm. And they're probably paying him nothing now. You guys but, know that better than me, but I, I think they're going to wait on him. That's true. Sure. Get fixed well, then, and his defense know. is unbelievable. I mean, right. he's got I mean, that's what I mean. range if, like no if one If he ever can figure out, and that's true for a lot of guys, I guess, but if he can ever figure out how to get on base, he's going to be just a, the, one of the biggest stars, I think, in the league. I, I mean, I don't get why with Hamilton they aren't doing one of two things at this point. Send him back down to AAA and try to get him to figure out how to bunt the ball and how to hit the ball. Or at least bat him lead off every single day. To, if, at the worst case, give him more at bats. I mean, they're batting Phillips in the leadoff spot. Yeah, leadoff's been a huge problem. Yeah, I don't, yeah. I don't get it. But, but they've got, I think, we, we talked about this, I think, last week. Until they get him to a point where he can get on base consistently, hit major league pitching, be more be more patient at the plate so he walks more. I think all this other stuff we're talking about really and truly kind of like falls by the wayside. I, I really don't really think it does. I think there's so much riding on this dude because he sets the table for your big hitters that if he can't get on base, all of this other stuff, you know, should we trade this guy? What prospect looks this way? I, I don't think it. I don't think it matters as much. I'm, I'm with you because yeah, I, I think fans need to buy into the fact that look around this diamond and who's playing where. Got an injured guy behind the plate trying to come back next year. They got a shortstop trying to come back next year, and the biggest thing is they got a center fielder who, on a good team, is a fourth outfielder yep. at best. Mm -hmm. So what do you do with a guy like that? That's why this team needs to rebuild. And we keep talking about Mike Leake, and I keep hearing the name Bronson Arroyo. Not only are they similar pitchers. They have the same similar contractual status. If you recall, Mike and Ken, the way it was a couple years ago when Roy was here, when they were deciding, should we offer him arbitration, should we not? What should we do with him? It, if, they don't want to have Mike Lee, Mike Lee in a situation to offer him arbitration because he might accept it. And if he does, you're looking at it between a 12 and $14 million pitcher on yeah. a team that clearly should be rebuilding. They have got to move Mike Leake by, you know, this time – tomorrow and uh, most teams know that but I still think he's going to go on a good team that's rebuilding he should even still be here well yeah. we, we know the uh, we know the present sucks <laughs> well we just talked about the future can we talk about the past Let's do one, it. one sure. of my favorite players August yeah, the that's 2nd, the center fielder we need yeah 1987 <laughs> Eric Davis becomes the seventh and the fastest to join the 30 30 <laughs> club when he hits a walk-off home run leading off the bottom of the 11th off Jeff Robinson 5-4 Reds beat the Giants at Riverfront, and no one has ever accomplished that feat with still nearly two months left to go in the season. Here's what I hear. But I, I, you're old enough to remember that, right? I don't remember that, but I'm old <laughs> enough to remember that. Okay. And, and I know John and I were, were, were covering uh, the team of the market. This is what I get on Eric Davis from everybody. Why is he not more intimately involved in the coaching of a Billy Hamilton? Why is he not more intimately involved with this team in lending his expertise? And I often, my answer is often, well, he's made millions in the game. He probably doesn't want the everyday hassle about that. But what better player to tutor a Billy Hamilton than Eric Davis? I think he has coached him a little bit. And I know Delano training, DeShields yeah. coached him quite a bit. I mean, Delano DeShields is a good leadoff man. I just, I don't, I don't, I don't know what Hamilton's deal is. Yeah. I, I, don't know, I don't know why he can't learn to bunt. I mean, that's the thing that's just staggering. Well, yeah. if, you, if you look at that, that graphic on Eric Davis, the amazing thing is he accomplished 30-30 by 
breaking his bat when he hit that home run. <laughs> I was going to ask if that was if that was the shot of when he hit the 30-30. You know, That's but it, it, it's interesting about Eric Davis because I was thinking about this the other day. If they do bring Barry Larkin back inside the franchise to be the manager of this club, and hopefully it'll be after a year or two when the team gets good again. But if they bring him back, I think it's a let pipe cinch that Eric Davis will be the hitting coach and probably Tom Browning will be the pitching oh coach. <laughs> yeah. And why wouldn't you? Yeah. I yeah. mean, those are great names and they're they're great teachers too. Yeah. But uh, I, rem I, re I remember that day. That was also the same year I think Davis, Matt, help me with this. That same year Davis hit, um, did he hit uh, four home runs in a double header? I think so. We, uh, yeah, you, he, I'm not sure that's true, but I know there was a point when, remember Don Carmen? For the yeah. Phillies, he right. lit him up for like three home runs, yeah. two or three times, or you know, he lit him up for like five home runs right. in two games or something like that. And went over the wall in center field to make a, bring a home run back. Yeah, well, that was that was when his his statistically best year, and I yeah. thought when I was watching it, he he was, and most people thought he was a lead pipe cinch to be the first 40-40 man. Right. He hit seven home runs in the last two months when he had 30 in the first three or four months. And he just sort of fizzled at the end. He had 37 home runs and 50 something, 50, 50 something yeah. stolen bases. But when I was that, I was in my 20s about then, he was my favorite red. He was I think he's the most exciting yeah. player that I've ever seen yeah. play baseball. Yeah. You know, he could he could just do everything in the outfield, like that play. I still remember the play in the league championship series against the Pirates when Hatcher ran into the wall. Do you remember that? Hatcher runs oh, into yeah. the wall, falls down. ED is playing left. He comes over, picks it up, throws it to third, and Benia slides in and he's out. And he looks up and they kept showing the replay and he didn't understand what had happened because he had seen Thatcher fall down. Yeah. He thought it was going to be a stand up triple. The third base umpires or coaches waving him down. And he just had that tight shot of him from the camera. And he looks up and he's just like, I don't get it. I thought I was going to walk yeah. in here. And he did, Eric just threw that laser like he could. He could throw that ball. Hamilton does it sometimes. He, he hits the ball and he throws it to third, but he throws it just high enough that the shortstop can cut it off if the guy tries to go. Mm -hmm. So he's thrown to the wrong base, but it's effective because they can't go because the shortstop can cut it off or let it go and it still makes it there on time. But he was my favorite player. Of Billy DeMars was his hitting coach. Remember Billy DeMars? He was Pete's uh, hitting yeah. coach in 87, and, uh, and something happened. They fired him at the end of the year, but, but I always thought Davis was a technically was a better hitter earlier in his career he didn't he didn't have the he didn't have the, the bat hitch. so low yeah and he, yeah. he was up higher and and for some reason I don't know Billy DeMars fell out of disfavor here or something happened they let, they let right you know Dave Davis is a great specimen we've all talked about different guys and I agree with Matt uh, that's my favorite player of all time even as a fan I barely got to watch Willie Mays play but I when I first saw Davis I, I just couldn't wrap my head around the fact that he was so fast and he had such power I'd never seen a guy like that before. And the guy I didn't see who had that was obviously Willie Mays. But I would love to see Eric back in a red uniform, Ken, to your point, for the 162 games. Yeah. And I think he'd be a great addition because not only was he a great talent, he's a great people person. You know that, Ken. You've covered him. And I think also he would be great for the kids in that clubhouse. He has a great demeanor about him and uh, would keep everybody nice and even keel, very much baseball-oriented. I think he'd be a great addition to the Reds uh, front of, uh, Reds uh, clubhouse. Have to give off uh, the music business though, his big uh, studio out there and his label and everything. Oh, is that right? Oh yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, so before the season, many uh, prognosticators picked the Reds to finish last in the National League Central uh, with a uh, season opening four game win streak and then the second half, that doesn't seem, didn't seem likely for a while. However, now, I mean, it's, it's real. I almost, I don't, I don't want to say I don't think there's a difference between finishing last or 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 fifth in this division. I think we all know what the what the scoop is. The problem really is in the upper tier of that division because the Cardinals are the Cardinals and the Pirates and the Cubs have two terrific organizations. And I think the headline here isn't so much that they're a game and a half or yeah, two and a half games out of last place. It's that the top of that division is so strong right now. And the Reds are so weak right now as an organization that they've really got to rebuild. I mean, it didn't take the Cubs, like Pete said, what did God tell the Cubs? Don't do anything until yeah, they get back. Right. The, the Pirates have been <laughs> coming out of the hole a long, long time, and they're finally out of it. And the Cardinals are the bell cow for the entire uh, Major League Baseball. So I, I just think it's imperative that they do the right thing here because they will never get up to the top of that division in the near future unless they do the right thing here 
and part with some of these guys that just weren't good enough when this team was good. I don't want to take the rosy, rose-colored glasses away from our fans, but every morning when you wake up, if you're a Reds fan and you say to yourself, can the Reds be good next year or the year after that? Look at the standings every morning when you wake up and say to yourself, can they be good again before 2018? The answer is clearly no because the Cubs are really, really good with great young talent. The Pirates have been on the come for a couple of years now. The Cardinals are the Cardinals. The Reds aren't even close no. to being in that same league. And for that reason, they really should trade off as many guys as they can. Yeah, the Cubs are six games over 500. They're ten and a half games out of first. Yeah, and the Cubs, I mean, you look at, the, the, you're going to look at a everyday starting lineup with the Cubs that is going to be all young guys right. and that are all just going to be mashing. I mean, you know, they, they, they don't have so many good young talented guys. They don't know what to do with them, where to put them. I mean, you're going to have Schwarber, catcher Rizzo uh, at first. You got Addison Russell, you got Starlin Castro, you got Bryant, yep. you got Baez, you got uh, Soler. I mean, that, that's a potential and what are the, and what are the six or seven guys that are all like 23, 24 years old. And what do the Cardinals do today? They lose Holiday, they go out and get the kid from Cleveland. Brandon Moss, yeah. yeah. So it's like. They're amazing. It's, it is. Yeah. It's just, but that's, that's what happens when you got a plan and when you got a farm system. And this team, I'm sorry, until that trade with Cueto, they don't have a farm system. They got, I guess they got good pitching. They got nobody else. They, they still have no successor at third base. They have no successor at second base. They have no successor in right field. Well, how, can you, how can you legitimately look at this organization and say, in, in two years, this team is going to be a contender? That's the whole point, Ken, is that you, we looked at those teams above the Reds, especially the Cubs, because people have to get over the idea of not trading within a division because you don't want to see yeah. this guy come back here. 18 times a year, but there's no question. A team that needs a closer, and they've got talent to give you for them, and the Reds shouldn't be afraid to trade him there, is the Chicago Cubs. Now, you hate the thought of him coming in here 18 times a year and blowing your guys away with 102-mile-hour fastballs, but don't worry about the short term. Get the best players for the long term. Do not be afraid to trade within the division. Give them, give them Chapman and Phillips for Baez. Thank you very much. Would do that. I, I just don't know what the Cubs will do that right. because the yeah. Cubs. I don't know if the Cubs want to face no. Baez for six years. Well, that, but but that, that's the way you should be thinking. And hopefully yeah. oh, they'll yeah. come around, especially as this deadline deadline gets nearer. Oh my gosh, uh, anybody should be a potential suitor right now. Yeah. I'm oh, just yeah. trying to look at Twitter here, make sure we haven't missed anything while I've been on. Yeah, right. And, uh, um, we were thought you were checking your doctor's appointment. Or something. No. <laughs> um, it's, it's funny, John Morosi writes for Fox Sports, he says, uh, Reds have to be pleased with Cueto, Price, and Hamels traded. Their Mike Leak may be next best with the moves before the deadline, which speaks to yeah, your, uh, yeah. your thing. Let's yeah. take a look at the upcoming schedule. Uh, Pirates in beginning a series on Thursday night, um, and then, um, and then the, uh, there's a weekend series with the Cardinals. Um, and that looked wrong. <laughs> that that looks yeah. strikingly wrong. Okay, how about this? There you go. There we go. That looks good. Uh, I, 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 I would love it if Cueto was back, and, then yeah. we, and we could keep yeah. Lamb also. So uh, if, if Leak makes that start on Sunday, um, you know there's trouble at Paradise. Uh, there, yeah. there, there just is. I, I can't for the life of me believe that Mike Leak will be with this team in 24 hours. I don't think so either. He was very smart to say, by the way, that he doesn't mind not hitting uh, even though he's a good hitter, then that tells me that there could be a potential suitor in the American League for him, which I would say is Yankees. clearly to me the Yankees. Uh, a guy we didn't talk about who uh, obviously is, is uh, working for the front office to let players know if they're traded, Mike Lorenzen um, plays uh, pitches <laughs> on Friday night against, uh, against the Pirates, and I left him out of, of the list of, of pitchers that, as you look at this team getting better going forward, he has, he's had a rough couple of outings recently, but I think there's another guy. I mean, Iglesias, Leak. I'm sorry, Iglesias, Lorenzen, Di Sclafani. Um, Di Sclafani was great yeah. last night. Yeah, and then, oh, then you, you, you believe Stevenson is going to be in the mix. Uh, Finnegan could be up here. Bailey will be back at some point next year. So the pitching isn't bad. And some of those players that they trade now, if they trade Leak, which they should, or, they, or Bird next month, you can flip these pieces for other players, which is yeah. which is part of the idea of stocking up on pitching. So you I just go out there and you get the best available talent, and people are always going to want good young pitching. So, Ken, so is it only when somebody else brings up the name of Glacius that you break into songs? Because I know it's you <laughs> yeah, brought yeah. up the name of Glacius there. You didn't launch in a Moonlight Lady or It Never Rains in Southern California. Can you give us a little bit, a few few hits of uh, of Julio Iglesias? 
Thank you, John. <laughs> <laughs> to all the girls I loved before. <laughs> Did he have any other song besides oh, that? Oh, well, Moonlight Lady. Moonlight Lady. I have already oh, yeah. been to the concert. Uh, yes, well, yeah, I have. <laughs> <laughs> that's, the inside, uh, that's the inside scoop on music. This is the fifth mascot. We're on every Thursday at 1.30 on WCPO.com and available 24-7 on WCPO.com. Tell your friends about us because we have no friends.